girl, you know we get sidetracked. Um, hey everybody, it's Tori O'Neill, the founder of The Mighty Dames, and we are here with Maggie Torres. How are you doing, Maggie? I'm well, how are you doing? Pretty good, all things considering. So we're here to talk about our next, um, well, our next selection for the Affirm and Amplify initiative. And I reached out to Maggie because I knew she was very much a supporter of literacy. And I felt like that was a good direction to go. We didn't really have anything. So first of all, Maggie, tell everyone about yourself, where you live in, where you training. All right. So um, I'm Maggie Torres. I actually own a gym with my husband in Spring, Texas called Torres Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. We are very creative with that. Um, <laughs> I'm a brown belt. I've been training about, I don't want to lie, I think nine years. I might be lying. I've been training nine years. Uh, I started in Seoul, South Korea. And yeah, I just love jujitsu and I love that we're going to be combining some kind of social justice aspects here. I think that's pretty cool. Absolutely. So for those of you who don't know what the affirmative amplify is, we say it's where jujitsu meets advocacy and it's our goal to bring attention to underserved communities or causes we feel that are very important. And our whole idea of this is that rash guards are great conversation starters. And so that's what we do. We make, um, we team up with fellow dames and we create a rash guard that supports a certain cause. So we picked, well, yeah, you and I picked early literacy. So let's just put it out there. It's like, what's your connection with the, the, with literacy and why do you feel like it's so important? Who? Um, well, just, I'm a just, you know, simple question, simple little question. Um, I'm a teacher. So I see firsthand, like how literacy can empower people. And I can also see firsthand how illiteracy makes people, um, makes life very, very difficult for people. Um, I've worked in schools where I've had students that were in 11th grade that I was teaching how to read. Uh, life is very, very difficult if you cannot read. Um, and they've kind of proven that so much of literacy, so much of your brain is formed from a very, very young age. So from birth to about five years old, we're learning the most that we can possibly learn. And I think it's actually between birth and three years old mm -hmm. that our brain develops. And it's, it kind of sets success, like for the future, being read to, being able to read, access, like there are not a lot of things that you can do if you do not have access to that. And that's a huge thing. Early literacy is just I'm passionate about it because I've seen where people started. I've seen where they go. I see how successful people have become when they, they're able to read. Um, yeah, I think it's just empowering. It's important. And obviously I'm biased because I'm a teacher. I'm an English teacher, but my mom was like a bookworm. So that was a big part of it. We are, we are like both book, like big book people. And it's crazy to think that in, even in 2022, that people can, you know, pass through this, through our education system, not knowing how to read or barely being able to read. Yeah. Um, yeah. So what is the nonprofit that you decided to focus on? So again, uh, those who don't know what we do is we're going to donate 25% um, of the proceeds from our t-shirts and our rash cards to the organization, which is? It's called First Readers. And it's a program that uh, started small and is becoming national. They've got branches in Alabama, Florida, Georgia, I don't want to lie, Iowa, uh, Mississippi, Missouri, South Carolina, Texas, uh, Virginia, and I think Montana, and they're working on spreading um, mm -hmm. across the United States. But what they do is they, um, they target particularly um, basically families that have need for uh, books or for literacy, or maybe families that are incredibly busy, usually uh, families that are low income, families that are in areas that are underserved, that lack resources, and they'll bring age appropriate books in for kids, uh, usually between the ages of zero and five, they do work with some kids older than that as well, but their primary goal is to get books into the hands of people that need them. And so it's not just a focus specifically on like the kids that can like already read, it's mm -hmm. let's get families reading, let's get families reading to kids, let's get basic early literacy skills, let's help prepare them for like school readiness, kind of prevent any problems that we might have because we don't necessarily have access to that. Yeah, I worked as a, I was, a, um, I worked as an early literacy um, program coordinator for about six years. And one of the things that I wasn't prepared for is that the, like we were giving out books to kids and what we were finding out is parents were learning to read with their kids. We had a lot, we have a big like um, migrant farmer population in some of these places and for some of these kids like they were literally getting going home and they were the parents were reading them together yeah. and so they they knew when the next book were coming and they were like ready to go so it is larger than just um changing a child's life it's literally can changing a, a, an entire family 
Yes. That time spent together mm-hmm. is so important too. I didn't realize, I mean, I knew it was important, but I, I have a, a two-year-old right now. The cutest <laughs> little thing. He's lucky he's cute because he's horrible. Oh, well, he looks like he could be a terror, but that's why he's cute because you have to look at something if you have to yeah. put up with the behavior. But he like, he loves books. He goes through books. I would say he's a voracious reader, but right now he's really just looking at pictures and screaming at words and making things up. But even seeing like how he has got inflections in the things that he says now, how he changes his tone. He's telling me things that are happening in the story. It's, it's really amazing as a parent watching like kids discover something like, I mean, you're mm-hmm. becoming a little human. You're finding interest, things that you like. Like if he doesn't want a book, he'll let me know. He throws it. This ain't it, mama. This ain't it. <laughs> dinosaurs trucks and wild children that's pretty much it right now (laughs) so those are his kindred souls right now um and like one of the things i noticed too is what's really cool is that um we're seeing the we're seeing like the increase of books that are starting to have like more diverse figures yes because what i'd have is i'd have a a population of volunteers are mostly older wealthier white people and they were reading to locations which are you know full of black and brown children but they didn't have any books with black and brown children and when they found a book these ladies were viciously hoarding them they would not they would share them amongst their clique of friends and that was it so it's great to see like all these books starting to come up that are just just more diverse and that's I like I think that's why I like this program so much is that it's not just like English language books as well like so it is targeting people who are immigrants it's targeting um it's targeting minorities definitely it's targeting Mm -hmm. people in communities A lot of kids in, and I'm a teacher, so I don't feel bad saying this. I think the public school system is getting better, um, but I do think a lot of kids kind of feel the pain of not seeing themselves represented in things. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm biracial. I remember growing up being thinking like, oh, I kind of look like this character. I kind of look like this character, but I don't identify with this. Uh I don't identify with this. And it's just like amazing seeing how much more diverse books have come. In fact, um, uh, what's his name? Neil Schusterman, who wrote Scythe. It's a young adult novel. The main character is biracial that is like literally one of the first times i've seen that in a book i'm an adult i read it at 32 years old and i started crying because i was just so excited like kids want to see themselves represented in books absolutely and you're seeing yourself all the time it doesn't seem like a big deal to you but when you don't and finally you're like oh man this kid is the same name as me yep this kid's also in a wheelchair or this kid also grew up in india mm-hmm. or whatever it is it's really empowering Definitely- i remember go ahead hmm. okay I said, I remember trying to explain to uh, my supervisor at the time that like, she wasn't understanding why I was saying like that we needed to find some books that um, we maybe should go out and purchase books with black and brown characters. But she's like, well, some of these books don't, they just, ha- they're just like animals and all that. I was like, yeah, but a lot of them have a kid who's following this animal around. And that kid is nine times, nine point, like 9.5% of the time, like they're white. And yeah. I think there was like this video going around when um, Encanto came out. Where they have like the little the little black boy who's oh. standing and look at the other little black boy he's like you know and like that's what we're talking about like representation yeah. is like again it, it tells you that it is possible for you to do something and i think what's really important with like a lot of um i know we're, we're saying a lot about black and brown people but it's not just us but like uh, what i think with um black and brown i think a lot of it has to do with income as well um lower income families i think when you see these books that are full of imagination, it tells them that it is okay to dream yes. and like picture this. Like I feel a lot of us, we have a very, we get into a very, at least myself and I'm, and I'm still trying to break out of this mold too. I get very pragmatic. I get very like focused on um, the X's and O's. We need to do this so we can have this standard of living. We have to do this. I don't have time to do this. And you know, that's a hard way to live, especially if you're a child. Definitely. So just like something as simple as being able to like play yeah and just like play make believe i feel like yes. we we miss that a lot in our community definitely i think representation changes the narrative because mm-hmm. you're you're not the other anymore i think that when you don't see yourself represented in books you are squarely outside of the, the literary community it's like oh i'm the other or there might be like this separate section like i remember as a kid like they were just starting to kind of I'm sure there were already diverse authors, but libraries just started putting up little sections that I would see it maybe on like Black History Month. There's like the Black section, there's this section, there's whatever. I'm seeing authors of color, authors of all backgrounds included in every literary canon. Mm-hmm. That's 
super important. Like you're not on the outside anymore. Like we're, we're in there. <laughs> yeah. And kids are seeing that and seeing yourself represented is like, okay, there's a place for me. I can do this. I can write. Mm-hmm. Um, I can imagine all these things that these other kids have imagined. I see myself represented in these books. I think that the moment where it made me smile is um, me and my girlfriend did like a we did like a date in our downtown area where we both went to our like this bookshop and we picked a book for each other. Went terrible. Let me just say that from the jump. We did not, we do not know each other's book styles, right? It went horrible. But I remember looking in the classic section and that's when the first time where I saw black authors included in the classic section and not somewhere else. They had like, it was just a bunch of, uh, it was a bunch of Zora Neale Hearst, which I know yeah. a part of that's because we're in Florida. But that's still, I'd never seen her included in a classic section. I'd either have to just look in general fiction or the black author section. Something that right there, because there are people who are not going to go look in the black author section, but they will look in the classic section and they might be reintroduced. They might be introduced to these authors. And I feel like some people feel like if it has a black character in it, it's not for me because I'm not black. But for a lot of black and brown people, we don't have that option to say that these books are not for us. It's required reading. Yeah, I think that's that's a really good point. I think on the opposite side of representation is just that we should read things with people who don't look like us, who Mm -hmm. don't act like us, who don't have the same... um, just like like background that we have also like uh one of my students brought up recently he was he's uh, autistic and he creates comic books he was saying you know i don't see a lot of superheroes with autism so i'm going to create it so he's created a series where the main character is a hero whose super powers like abilities are literally being autistic he's like i can focus on things longer than people i know every highway in america (laughs) i can like which is really impressive he'd be great for road trips but like Mm -hmm. genuinely it's like it's creating like if there's a need for it and we create it it's great but when people do things like that it also makes it so that this is not an unattainable dream this Mm -hmm. is possible Mm-hmm. Well, that's one of the reasons why we wanted to do the Affirm and Amplify series in general is to, you know, bring awareness to things that we might not think about. You know, if you don't have kids, you're not probably not really thinking about early literacy. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's like you don't think about it. Like some people don't think about it unless they're in that field or they have children of their own. I'm um, similar with our past when we did Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women. I can honestly say it, that's something I'd heard about. Never thought about it any, any more than of I saw the symbols, but being um working with that program it it opened my mind to so much more it made me so much more aware and you know and i'm better for that so i feel like that's a it's just an important idea to not just get outside of your bubble but actively seek things that have nothing to do with you Uh, and i think the interesting thing about that is like people who weren't exposed super early they probably don't or people who were even probably kind of take that for granted they don't realize actually how important it is even in their later life. Like mm-hmm. I was seeing a statistic, I think it was on their website, 61% of low income families don't have a single book suitable yeah. for a child mm-hmm. in their household. Um, kids who are not exposed to reading or haven't developed some basic literacy practices are five times more likely to be incarcerated. Like there are some really like- It's dark. Heavy, heavy implications of like not having that. And the mm-hmm. only like, behavior measure that they found that correlates significantly with reading scores is the number of books that somebody has in a home. And as we know, access to education is not always equitable. It's not always fair across the board. So whatever you can do to kind of put yourself in the best possible position is really helpful. And I think that's why I like this program so much is they're like, we can't necessarily fix all the inequality issues, but we can set this up to give people a fighting chance. And that's so important. Well, I think that's the thing that people don't realize is like we, and this is another reason why we like to focus on um, smaller, like um, like a, a certain branch in a certain community is small things can make such a huge impact down the line. You know, like a person that you meet, something that you've been exposed to. My sister's going to hate me, but I use this and ex- I use her as an example all the time. This kid, she's supposed to be 29. I can't call her a kid anymore, but <laughs> she hated to read. I mean, hated to read to the point where she would, <laughs> it's not funny. It's really not funny. She would Christmas tree exams like the reading, like the, the state exams that r- required her to read things. She's like, I'm not doing this. So she had to be like an intensive reading. She had to do all this stuff until a teacher introduced her to um, Carrie by Stephen King. Oh, and wow. she like, and if you see my sister, my sister is like, doesn't seem like that would be her, her genre. 
but it found out that she really liked reading horror. She liked yeah. looking at supernatural stuff. And from that, she was like, oh, this is really good. Cause Carrie's not a very good book, but it led her to like, what other books from this author? Have you heard of this Stephen King? We're like, yeah, he's got a lot of stuff, but that, that like hit the spark. And now this kid has phones on her book. I still have some of her books here. She's like a constant reader. And, you know, if it wasn't for someone just exposing that to her, she could have yeah. gone her entire life though. She could have failed school because <laughs> yeah. she wouldn't take, because the one time she's like, ah, eh, I figured I was, I just try on this time. The kid passed, but she just, the, the process of reading, it was just like, it, it so did not, it was something she did not care about that much. She was willing to fail a test to do it. Well, I would say too, though, that the nature of kind of America in general is that standardized testing particularly reading tests are kind of killing our love for reading our love Absolutely. for creativity, our love for writing we're teaching to a test and if like between the ages of zero and three 85 percent of your brain's core structure is formed so if within that core structure i'm introducing you to all these things that you're excited about and you're interested about by the time you get to school you're aware that there are other things out there mm -hmm. okay i might not like what i'm reading on this test and i might not like doing this but guess what when i go home i'm going to read this dinosaur mm -hmm. Or this book by R.L. Stein. I think R.L. Stein made people fall in love with reading. If you're a millennial, you what? were like, oh, I can't wait. Those goosebumps? Or Listen. choose an adventure or whatever. And you can tell by the covers like, oh, this one's going to be good. <laughs> I still remember the marionette one. I picked it. Oh, my God. Oh, it was so creepy. And it was the worst one, actually. But to be fair, the cover was like, so it's, it was, you I was fashions. I was a, um, I was a boxcar children and I was a babysitters clubs yeah. slash babysitter club little sisters that sweet valley high, sweet valley high. <laughs> oh listen oh wait a minute sweet valley junior high was my jam because you know i was at that age because my mom said she read sweet valley high like i'm not gonna do that i'm a millennial new age junior <laughs> such trash <laughs> but you know it, that's probably why i don't read fiction to this day i only read nonfiction books i can't do you see how like one negative experience can mm -hmm. shape how people feel about things? So that's why it's like, get these positive experiences yeah. early on, get them to realize like, okay, all of reading is not this passage on the star test that asked me whether the author meant for it to be blue or meant oh for my it gosh. To be blue. It's like, there are things outside of what I'm learning here that I love. And I bless reading teachers for knowing their kids so well that they're mm -hmm. like, hey, why don't you try this? Why don't you try this? Yeah. And that's why it kind of scares me so much that we're getting rid of so many reading programs that yeah. reading is not say, a class in schools anymore. Because when I was in school, it was a class. We took mm -hmm. a reading class, we laid out on bean bags and we read. I tell my students that now and they're like, that's crazy. We were in kindergarten. I was like, I mean, yeah, we did that when we were young, but I did that in high school. Too. Yeah, I had a re I, we had a reading class, but it was only for ninth grade and you only continued it if you were having issues. I loved it. Yeah. So like, and like, do people do book reports anymore? Um, I can't speak on everywhere. I will say like where I'm in my district, they may be Mm, very rarely. And I think a lot of that is just because like we're in the generation of like spark notes and things. Like yeah. That. You know? Listen, when I found yeah. out what spark notes was, <laughs> there was yes, no it's way killing reading it's killing. I it. understand, but there was no way I was reading Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. I refused to read that oh, book. Okay. I, this is the part, this was the age where I started developing like a dislike of fiction. I was like, I'm not going to read this book. And you want me to read a space fiction? I'm not doing it. I don't not, know the Scarlet Letter. The Scarlet Letter ruined ninth grade for everybody. That was oh terrible. My, so uh, that right there is like, oh, so people have just been misogynistic for years. This is just a thing now. <laughs> really, we're we're really branding. Wow, like <laughs> that's that's a whole other issue I have with these supposed classics that are like, it's kind of those are kind of trash people. But if okay. you, you know, yeah, I don't disagree <laughs> with that at all. <laughs> Like, luckily, kids aren't really getting those at that yeah. age. I really hope y'all are still finding great things. But I did see actually some children's books are starting to be included in the classics. And that's pretty awesome. I love seeing Marie Sendek where the wild things are. Yes. In there, that's such a like nostalgic book for so many people. Speaking of children. Hi, Cairo. Hi. Can you say hi quick. Do cry. Say hi. Yeah. No. 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 Hi. Say hi. He's an early reader. So where the wild things are. Is there you go. It's, uh, I, I can see that. So what, what we talk about, I see you have one the design, the shirt uh -oh. on right now. No, no. No? 
What a daddy. Um, yeah, so let's take a look at this. Yeah. So we are all made of stories. Um, I love that. I think when we were coming up with this and we were talking about all the different like ideas, we ran through like a couple different mm -hmm. films. And I think for me, this was the one that was like, I feel like the most people are going to connect with that because mm -hmm. again, like making things personal, if there's a story that you connect with, you see yourself in that story, mm -hmm. it makes you want to keep on reading. I think honestly, that's probably why he likes that book so much. That kid is wild. The kid <laughs> gets in trouble for like hitting his mom, biting his mom. He gets sent to bed without dinner. That's Cairo. Did you have a photo shoot with him with the yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah we had a reading photo shoot where the wild that's things awesome are. it's like seeing yourself in that book is like oh i'm okay that's me that's me represented in this so he needs to stop biting people but I mean, yes he's, like, <laughs> he's a biter he's a biter yeah oh yeah he bites strangers now too so <laughs> but the whole idea of that we're made, all made of stories it goes great into the whole into jujitsu in general is like we all get to the sport for different reasons and you know we never know like what our what our path is where jujitsu is going to lead us what our what is what is our end goal here if there really is one so i think that's i i again i i really like that whole term of like we're all made of stories because there's a lot of man for some of us we got volumes on volumes on volumes that created us so yeah. it's it's just I, I like that phrasing and um so yeah that's what we're going to be doing so we're going to start this um July 1st, we have the t-shirts, which Maggie has on. And then we have lovely rash guards, which I will add, I will show somewhere in here, but- um, And was sweaty, I would have brought it. <laughs> but I mine just, is like right there, but like, I I can't get up right now. No, I just can't do it. I can't do it. I went for a, I went for like a, a, a jog because I'm trying to get back into, I'm trying to get like physically and mentally back to a space where I can train. But my yeah. knees have not agreed with the rest of my body that we're we're trying to physically and mentally. So they're like, oh, so you're trying to run after nine months of inactivity. Okay, okay. sit down for the rest of the day. <laughs> um, smash pass everyone. Yeah. So like I'm just yes, yeah, smash pass everyone. Also on the Mighty Dames. Um, so yeah, we'll this will be in the Mighty Dames store on July 1st. Um, all of our proceeds will go to the first readers program. I think we're gonna do the one in Texas, correct? Yeah, yeah 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 we're gonna do the branch in texas and we will keep track of all of of how much money we're raised our our goal is to raise at least 300 dollars. so we're gonna try to get there as close to it as possible um what else do i want to say read yes read a book today like put in like a i'm like i'm biased i don't like like ebooks and I, i'd say read an actual physical book but just read a yeah. book any book and Let's actually Something that I do want um, to kind of leave people with as well is I was just looking at this website because I was looking at kind of first readers thing and why they say it's so important. And if people don't realize like the actual issues and like disparity between like low income families, professional families, one of the statistics on here says the average child from a professional family hears 215,000 words per week. A child from a working class family typically hears 125,000 words per week. And a child from a family receiving welfare benefits typically hears 62,000 words per week. Like that's a pretty large amount of like inequality. Yeah. So not realizing kind of how important that is to bridge that gap. I think that's kind of evidence in and of itself, mm -hmm. right? like words, read, speak. Very much. And one of the things that um, I learned very early on from my know my years working at early literacy is it's not just reading a story with someone that can help it's talking about the story afterwards yes. you know, asking you about the, yeah asking about the characters what you think they were doing um we had one person say like well what do you think they did after the book was over yeah those I kids went wild from they went to get a burger to they went to disney world to one big girl was like uh-uh she only wears this so she's clearly going to the clothing store like it was a whole thing, but again, it, it sparks that imagination. It makes them, yes. it makes them communicate more, makes them think. So that's what we're trying to do is we're trying to increase their literacy size and just make them think more. It's like, yay, this was fun. Yeah, it's always nice it. talking to you, Maggie. So <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, guys, make sure to look at the Mighty Dames and we'll have all the information up there for you.